Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil Alemin. Ve salatu ve selamu ala şerefil enbiyeyi vel mursalin Muhammed ve Resulullah sallallahu aleyhi ve aleyhi ve sahibi ve sellem. Tesliman kathiran kathira. Fa ma ba'du. My brothers and sisters, I'm starting a new series uh, this week. Every Wednesday at the same time, which is 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. Um, we will talk about the lives of the Prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the lives of the Anbiya alayhim salam and the Rasuls of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The purpose of this is of course to remind ourselves of these great lives as well as and even more importantly to see how we can apply the lessons from the lives of the Anbiya alayhim salam into our own life today. The purpose of the lives of Allah, the purpose of the lives that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us of the Anbiya alayhi wa is so that people take a lesson from those lives and apply those lessons in their own lives. The Anbiya alayhi wa came as guides. They came to teach the world how to live. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this universe. In this universe, he created this planet Earth. On this planet Earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in due course sent human beings. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't just send the human beings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the human beings with guidance of how to conduct their affairs. Of who to worship, who to obey, how to conduct their affairs between each other between uh, themselves, how they must conduct their affairs with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent guidance on every aspect of life. The purpose of the guidance is for the benefit of the human beings and whoever is on this planet earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself, who was samad, lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakullahu kufwan had. He is completely self-sufficient. He is not in need of anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nobody can harm him, nobody can benefit him, uh, nobody can give him, nobody can take away from him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we live our lives in obedience to the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we do it for our own benefit. We don't benefit Allah. We are not doing a favor to Allah. We are not doing any ihsan on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we live our lives in the way that was taught by the Anbiya alayhi salam, then this is good for us. As human beings, we can have a society, we can create a society which is just, which is compassionate, uh, where there is equitable distribution of wealth, where everyone is happy, people are employed, people are, um, people are uh, living lives where they are satisfied with their lives. On the other hand, if we don't do that, then we harm ourselves. As we can see amply today, I mean, I don't think I need to um, elaborate on that. There is enough misery and enough suffering uh, and enough injustice and cruelty and oppression in this world uh, for anyone to take a lesson from them and anyone to ask this question and say, why, is, why does all this happen? Many people ask this uh, very erroneous question and I don't know why but Muslims tend to get very defensive about it and they feel very shaky uh, when people say that if there is a God, why is there suffering, right? Uh, if there is a God, why is he allowing suffering to happen? The short answer to that is that God gave you the ability and the guidance to remove the suffering. You don't do it. And then you blame God, right? I mean, this is like, uh, for example, if I tell you that if you are in my kitchen, for example, and I've got an electric hot plate, it is no flame and fire, but it's electric hot plate. It's turned on, so it's hot. So I say to you, watch out, be careful, don't put your hand on that thing because it's extremely hot. You will burn yourself. Now, I've given you the guidance. Despite that, you go and you put your hand on the hot plate, you get... You lose some skin, you get burnt, you are, in, you are in, in terrible pain. And then you blame me and you say, well, you were in the kitchen. How come I burnt my hand? Well, what am I going to do? I was in the kitchen, yes. I showed you and I told you that this thing is hot. 
and I told you what will happen to you if you touch it. Despite all that, despite understanding what I told you, you go and touch it and then you want to blame me. Now this is exactly the situation today when people say, if there is a God, why is there suffering? If there is a God, why doesn't he do something? Well, he did already. He created you. He gave you resources. He gave you a mind. He gave you intelligence. He gave you guidance. <clears throat> he sent his Anbiya alayhi salam. He sent his prophets to guide you. He sent his kitabs. He sent his books to guide you. Now, you ignore the Anbiya. You refuse to listen to them. You refuse the guidance. You reject the books. You insist on living your life according to your own base uh, desires. Only and only to satisfy your desire, your nafs. And obviously, there is a price to pay. We are free to choose, but no choice is free. Every choice comes with a price tag. We are free to choose, but no choice is free. Every choice comes with a price tag. And that's what we are paying, we are paying now. We are paying the price of our choices. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Zahra al-fasadu fil barri wal bahri bima kasabat aydi nas li yuziqahum ba'da alladhi amilu la'allahum yarjihun In Surah Al-Rum, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the fasad, the trials and tribulations and difficulties and the calamities that we see on the sea and the land are a result of the deeds of human beings. They are the result of your amal, the result of the deeds that come from your hands. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that you are writing your own destiny. You are creating difficulties for yourself. And Allah is saying Allah allows it to happen because the difficulty with it brings its pain. So Allah is saying that he allows it to happen so that you can get a taste of uh, the, the taste of the deed, the taste of the within quotes, reward of the deed so that you turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now what does it mean? It means that this deed actually the recompense for it, the punishment for it is very severe. What you are getting in this world is only a taste of that. If you do not turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you continue to live a life of disobedience, creating evil around you, then a time will come when you will be called to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then the punishment that you will receive will make this one look like a Sunday school picnic. It is something that is uh, not imaginable by us because there the punishment is, the punishment in the Akhirah is extremely, extremely severe. Now in order to save us from that punishment, in order that we learn the lessons that we need to learn in this dunya and live a beautiful life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his Anbiya alayhi So this uh, series of lectures that I am uh, starting now, has to do with that, has to do with the issue of the stories of the Anbiya and what we can learn from them inshallah. At the end of each of these stories, uh, or rather at the end of each lecture, because story might take more than one lecture, at the end of each lecture, we will have an action plan sheet where I want you to listen to the story carefully and then in the action plan sheet, I want you to write down what did you learn from the story as a result of which, what is the action in your life that you are going to start doing? What is it that you don't, that you do not do at this moment, but you're going to start doing it? What is it that you uh, do currently, which you realize from listening to the story of the Nabi, that this thing which you are doing is wrong, so that you're going to stop doing it? And then what is it that you are doing in your life, which is good, alhamdulillah, so you will consciously continue to do it? So what will you start, what will you stop, and what will you continue? This is what we will do at the end, inshallah, of each of these lectures. So I will begin, inshallah, we will start with the story of, uh, uh, we will start with the introduction to this uh, course itself, where I need to explain to you certain terminology and all that. Very, very important that we start with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalla. There was Allah and there was nothing else. There was no creation, there was no earth, there was no sun, there was no moon, there was no universe. There was only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalla. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was never born. Allah didn't come from anywhere. Allah always is, always was, and always will be. Huwa al-hayyul qayyum. He is the one who is alive and he is the one who is established in a way that suits his majesty and grace. There was Allah and there was nothing before him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that his arsh is on water. One important thing I want to say to you here is that our aqidah as far as these things, for example, the arsh of Allah, this arsh is on water. Uh, Allah is on his arsh, istawa ala arsh, and so on and so forth. The kursi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, where is the kursi in relation to the arsh? Is it on it? Is it in front of it? Is it behind it? On the side of it? All such questions of the ghaib, our aqidah is that we believe what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us in the Quran without asking how, without asking why. Bila kaif. We don't ask why, we don't ask how. Bila kaif, without how. We do not conjecture, we do not speculate, we do not philosophize. We do not say this means that, that means this. No. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Bi yadihil khair. He said, in his hand there is khair. Now we do not speculate to say, the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does it look like? Does it have fingers? If it has fingers, how many fingers? Does it have a thumb? Uh, and so on and so forth. No. Allah used the term hand with respect to himself. It is one of his attributes. Bi yadihil khair. In his hand there is khair. What do we believe? We believe, if somebody says, does Allah have a hand? We say, yes. What does it look like? We don't know. If Allah wanted us to know, he would have told us. And we don't say that hand means this, hand means that. No, hand means hand. What is the nature of that? We don't know. We don't ask. This is our aqidah as far as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is concerned. I want to make this very clear so that we are... Uh, we, 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 we know this and we are clear about this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created his arsh, which is on water. He created the pen, the qalam, and ordered it to write all that there was to be. And it was all recorded in Allahul Mahfuz, in the book, which is the preserved tablet, the preserved book. Now this includes our risk, which was written long before creation came into being. The term used is 50,000 years. We know that time as it exists in this world, in this life, has no meaning with regard to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Time is time, whatever Allah means. Meaning that this was done, uh, it was written long before we were born. Now I want you to think about this and say, what is the action item out of this? Now to me, the action item out of this is number one, which is, to clear and correct my aqidah about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalla. I have explained to you the aqidah with regard to Allah. First and foremost that Allah only is worthy of worship. There is no one worthy of worship except Allah. There is no one who can benefit or harm except Allah. La nafi wa la dharra illa Allah. La ilaha illa Allah. There is no one who fulfills any need except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no one who has any strength and power and authority except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. So all of these things we need to reiterate and we need to correct in our lives and we need to uh, ensure that we believe that our belief is correct, that the belief is not false, that the belief is correct. And then we must understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our riz, raziq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are his creatures, we are his slaves, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us whatever we need in relation to his knowledge about us. Right? Now, uh, on a side note, many times the word abd, abdullah, the slave of Allah, is wrongly translated, especially in the English Quran, as servant of Allah. Right? Uh, this is wrong because, please understand, uh, words have specific meanings. A servant is somebody who comes into your employment voluntarily, gets a salary and can at any time the servant has the right to voluntarily leave your employment. An abd, a slave, belongs to you. You own the slave. The slave cannot leave your employment because he is not your employee, he is your slave. Now, we are the ibad of Allah. Allah called us Abdullah. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his abd. Subhanallah zi asra bi abdihi. The Arabic word for servant is khadim. Allah did not say khadimihi. Allah said abdihi, his slave. To be the slave of Allah is the greatest honor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave this greatest of honors to Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam by calling him his slave. The Sahaba asked Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they said, Ya Rasulullah, how should we address you? Uh, we want to prostrate before you. We want to make sajda to you, not sajda of ibadah, but sajda of ihtiram, sajda of respect. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prohibited even that. He said, you simply address me as Rasulullah and Abdullah and Rasulullah. Right? He said, Abduhu wa Rasulu. The, the abd, the slave of Allah and his messenger. So let us understand this thing. This is a wrong translation when people say servant of Allah. We are not servants of Allah. We are not the khadimeen of Allah. We are the ibad of Allah. And it's the greatest honor to be the abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now we are using this term nabi. Right? The, the word we are using nabi. Ambiya is the plural of nabi. So who and what is a Nabi? And what is, another word which we use is Rasul. So who is Rasul? Also, uh, the number of them and how many did Allah send? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, sent Anbiya and Rasul to every community. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Anbiya and Rasul to uh, every uh, part of the earth. Abu Dhar Ghifari radiallahu anhu asked Rasulullah sallam about the number of Anbiya. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said 120,000 out of which 315 were Rasul. What is the difference? The Nabi is a person who comes to guide, to show the way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes sends one Nabi to a Community, sometimes he sends two, sometimes he sends three. In Surah Al Yasin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that he sent three Ambiya to a particular community. Uh, the Rasul, on the other hand, is also a Nabi, but the Rasul comes with a book. The Rasul comes with a Sharia. The Rasul comes with a complete way of life. So every uh, Rasul is a Nabi, but every Nabi is not a Rasul. So the Nabi is the basic, within quotes, if I can use the term qualification, and the Rasul is the, uh, ad, is, is, the, is the advanced of that, which is somebody who came also with a Sharia, with a book. The, um, the Anbiya who come after the Rasul are on the Sharia of the Rasul who came before them. So they uh, they, they reinforce that Sharia. Having said that, it is not necessary that every Rasul has to come with a new Sharia. For example, Isa alayhi salam didn't come with a new Sharia. Isa alayhi salam came on the same Sharia as Musa alayhi salam and he brought the people or he invited the people to come back and return to the Sharia of Musa alayhi salam. So he didn't come with a new Sharia. Whereas Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa came with a new Sharia. After Musa a.s., the Sharia, the next Sharia, which is the last and final of them, which is valid until the Day of Judgment, is the Sharia of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa wasallam. So this is the, the difference between the Nabi and the Rasul. My brothers and sisters, I remind you and myself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا لِيُطَاعَ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ In Surah Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, We sent no messenger, but to be obeyed by the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Anbiya came to be obeyed. They did not come to be disobeyed. They didn't come with the uh, condition that obedience to them is voluntary. It is uh, something which is uh, left to our whims and fancies. It is discretionary. I feel like obeying, I obey. I don't want to obey, I don't obey. No. The Anbiya salam came to be obeyed. If there was, a, if, if a Nabi has come to you and you don't obey him, 
then you have gone out of the fold of Islam. So every Nabi who came, the people of the time, they were compelled to obey that Nabi, compelled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no force as in uh, human compulsion. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I have sent the Nabi in order to be obeyed. So this is a compulsion from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is the last of the Anbiya and the last of the Rusul. As I told you, if you simply say last of the Anbiya, that is good enough because every, every Rasul is a Nabi. But in the case of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said both. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِّن رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَاكِرْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْنَ عَلِيمًا In Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not the father of any man among you, but he is the messenger of Allah and the last, the end, the seal, خاتم النبيين, the seal of the prophets, the end of the prophets, the last of the prophets. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ever all aware of everything. It is part of our aqidah that we believe that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is the Nabi of Allah, he is the Rasul of Allah and he is the last and final Nabi and final Rasul after whom there is no Nabi and no Rasul. So anybody who declared prophethood, anybody who declared um, that he or she was a prophet after Rasulullah we reject them. They are false and we reject this falsehood whoever it might be. Rasulullah is the last of the prophets. After him, there is no prophet. This is what the Quran is saying. This is what Nabi also said. But here I am just st- sticking with the Quran. This is what the Quran is saying, which means this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. If somebody now comes after Rasulullah as happened in the case of Ghulam Ahmad Khadiani, or as happened in the case of Musail Mal Kazab, or uh, al um, Aswad al-Ansi and other people uh, who claim to be prophets after Rasulullah we reject that because their claim goes against the Quran. And if somebody's claim goes against the Quran, then what, what do we have to do that claim? We have nothing to do that claim. We, we reject them. We, uh, we, we point them and their followers to the Quran and we say, here is this ayat of Surah Al-Ahzab. Please go read it for yourself. This is your Rabb Jalla Jalaluhu telling you very clearly that Muhammad Sallallahu is the last and final of the prophets, final of the Anbiya, final of the messengers, final of the Rasul. And after him there is nobody else. And if you believe somebody else is there, then you are saying that you know more than Allah about who is a Rasul and who is, a, uh, who is not a Rasul, which makes absolutely no sense. We don't argue with them. There's no need to argue. The Quran is the final argument. The Quran is the proof of the truth and of their falsehood. Now, why should we learn about the Anbiya Alayhi Wasallam? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةِ الرَّسُولًا أَنِ اعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُوا الطَّاغُوتِ فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ هَدَى اللَّهُ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ هَقَّتْ عَلَيْهِ الضَّلَالَةِ فَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَانْظُرُوا كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الْمُكَذِّبِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah An-Nahl, And verily, we have sent among every ummah, every community, every nation, a messenger. And what did the messenger say? Worship Allah alone and keep away from taghut, which is all false deities. Do not, do not uh, worship them. And then of them were some whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided, which means that their hearts were sincere and they wanted guidance, they got guidance. And there were others upon whom their straying was justified, meaning that they rejected the message of the Anbiya and therefore they were left to their own devices. So travel through the land and see what was the end of those who denied the truth. Now, the three or four very important things in Zaya. First thing is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that there is a, a, a Nabi or a Rasul was sent to every nation. Now, sometimes we get asked this question. People say, for example, in India, people say, what about Buddha? What about Siddhartha Gautam Buddha? He, he, he could have been a Nabi. Uh, somebody says, what about Krishna? 
he could have been a Nabi. What about Rama? He could have been a Nabi. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying very clearly two things. Number one, he is saying that he sent a Nabi to every Ummah. Out of these Anbiya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala named some of them. Uh, we know those names from what Rasulullah told us and what those names have come in the Quran. So we know the names from the Quran. But very importantly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, we sent a messenger to every people. And what did the messenger say? He said, worship Allah and do not worship false deities. Whether these are idols, whether these are philosophical concepts, whether these are, uh, you know, different theologies, uh, whether these are actual people, whoever, anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do not worship. La ilaha illallah. So if somebody says, what about so and so, what about so and so, people who have not been named in the Quran, but you say, well, you know, this person came to this, to this country uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the past, and uh, this person could have been a Nabi, what do you think? What do you think? Did that person preach La ilaha illallah? If that person preached La ilaha illallah, and specifically not one God and so on, illallah, illa Allah, is not saying La ilaha illa, illa, la ilaha illa, ilahu wahid, no. We're not saying there's no one worthy of worship except one God, no. We're saying there's no one worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if the person who came preached this, La ilaha illallah, then it is possible that this person could have been a Nabi of Allah. If the person did not preach that, if they preach something else, then there is no chance of that person having been a Nabi of Allah because no Nabi came and preached anything other than La ilaha illallah. So that's a, that's a very important thing to understand. Of course, there is no need to argue with anybody. There is no need to speculate. That's not the purpose of the Anbiya who came. They didn't come for you, for you to argue about them. They came to teach us. And what is the lesson that we need to learn? La ilaha illallah. There is no one worthy of worship except Allah. So the lesson is that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Second very important thing in this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that despite the fact that the Nabi came, some people were guided and some people could not be guided. Why were they not guided? Not because Allah didn't want to guide them. If Allah, this is another question. People say, you know what? If, if Allah wanted to guide me, he could have guided me. If I am now misguided, then I, I'm, I can't be punished because it's not my fault. Well, if Allah wanted to misguide you, then Allah would not have sent the Anbiya. The whole point of blaming Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your misguidance falls flat because the Nabi came in order to be obeyed. As I mentioned to you from the earlier ayah, the Nabi came in order to be obeyed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Anbiya for guidance. If someone is not guided, despite the fact that the Nabi came, then the responsibility rests firmly on their own shoulders. Because if you wanted guidance, here was the guide. So you should have followed him. Why didn't you follow him? If you didn't follow him, then it means that you wrote your own destiny and you wrote your own punishment. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also told us, Allah said, travel through the land and see what happened to those who disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, those people who denied the truth, see what happened to them. My brothers and sisters, we, liked, we, 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 we live in an age of tourism. We live, we, we live in an age where travel has become very, very common. When I was growing up as a child, if someone was going, was taking a flight to some other place, people would go to the airport all very well dressed in suits and sherwanis and whatnot. They would take garlands, they would garland this person and they would send him off. It's not because they, you know, they, they didn't think he was coming back. But this was, it was such a uh, unique thing. It was, it was so, uh, you know, remarkable that people took time off to go to the airport to see off a person and they used to garland them and all that. Um, people in those days, uh, they used to, you know, sort of like we, like some people name drop, they used to drop this in conversation. They would say, oh, you know, I flew here. I came here by flight. Now today it doesn't, it, nobody even talks about that because it's normal. I mean, how else do you go, right? I mean, in some places there are trains, but other than that, uh, flight is how you go. I mean, there is no big deal of saying, I came here by plane, so who cares? Um, fl flying and, and travel has become so common. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, don't just travel mindlessly. 
uh, you know, like tourists and, and click, click, click photographs. And they reflect and think about that. When you go to the pyramids in Egypt, think about the look at the pyramid and say, Subhanallah, this is the tomb of a pharaoh, of a king. The tomb is so huge and magnificent and so massive. What must the palace of that king have been like? Because obviously this is a tomb. The palace is where the man lived. What must that have looked like? What kind of gold and silver and marble and Allah knows what? What must his armies have looked like? What kind of authority did, they, did he have? What happened to all of that? How come the one man, Musa alayhi salam, comes there and he is able to take his people away and all the power of Firaun uh, could not save uh, him from the punishment which came? And this is where we reflect and we ask ourselves this question. And the reason for reflection is not philosophy. The reason for reflection is to bring it round and say, that if this could happen to somebody with so much of wealth and so much of power and so much of authority and so much of strength and, and military and so on, what about me? If I am going to become rebellious and if I want to stand up and, and uh, fight with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how far am I going to get? This is the, the purpose. The, the purpose is to reflect and say that Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us Iman. So we have the uh, we we have we are grateful to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for this iman. Now now Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said about those who obey the Ambiya Ali Musalam, who live a life where they are obedient to the Ambiya Ali Musalam. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, "Man amila salihan min zakarin aw unsa wa huwa mu'minun, fala nuhiyannahu hayatan tayyibatan wala najziyannahum ajrahum bi ahsani ma kanu ya'malun." فَإِذَا قَرَأَتَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ لَهُ سُلْطَانٌ عَلَى الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ إِنَّمَا سُلْطَانُهُ عَلَى الَّذِينَ يَتَوَكَّلُونَهُ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ بِهِ مُشْرِكُونَ يَتَوَلَّوْنَهُ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ بِهِ مُشْرِكُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Nahal Allah said whoever does good deeds whether male or female, while he or she is a true believer. So two conditions. One, we need to be true believers and two, we need to do good deeds. And the Quran does not differentiate between man and woman. Both genders are equal in terms of duties and equal in terms of the reward that they get. Differential payment is only in some countries today. Right? Women get less money than men. As far as Islam is concerned, they are both equal. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever works righteous deeds, whether male or female, while he or she is a true believer, verily to them we will give a good life in this world with respect, contentment and lawful provision and we shall pay them certainly a reward in proportion to the best of what they used to do in the Jannah. And imagine, see this mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If maybe I was doing so many good deeds, but one of them was really superior. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward me inshallah for all the good deeds in keeping with that one which was very superior. Subhanallah. That's the reason why it's so important for us to try to excel, right? Not have this minimalist thinking of doing the minimum of what we can do. No. Try to do more and more because the best that you can do, that will be the standard by which you will be paid for everything. So it is in our interest to ensure that at least one deed I do with complete and total sincerity only and only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to a level of ihsan. Whether it is salah, whether it is charity, whether it is hajj, whether it is umrah, whether it is fasting, whatever it is, service to our parents, service to our, uh, to our families and so on and so forth. At least one thing, at least make sure that, that in your life there is one peak. There is one peak where you do the best, absolute best, and that, inshallah, will be the standard according to which you will be paid for everything else which you did in life, which was not of that standard. So my one salah is absolutely superior, but I'm going to be paid, inshallah, by the reward of that one salah for all my other salawat which were not of the same standard. So it is in our interest to try and do that. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, and then, so when you want to recite the Quran, seek the refuge, seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from shaitan. 
the outcast. Auzu billahi minash shaitanir rajim. Before we we read Quran, we must say Auzu billahi minash shaitanir rajim. And then Allah says, verily, don't fear the shaitan. He is your enemy. Fight him. No need to fear him. Allah says, verily, he has no power over those who believe and put their trust only in the Rabb. Right? Allah subhanahu wa taala is saying that he has no power. Inna hu laysa sultanun ala ladina amanu wa ala Rabbihim yatawallun. Inna ma sultan hu ala ladina yatawallun hu wa lahum bihi mushrikun. Allah says his power is over those who obey and follow him and who join partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now my brothers and sisters, it's a beautiful ayah that we need to think about and say that uh, what is it that I must do? We obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we try and excel in our good deeds, we remain people of faith and then when we recite Quran, and before we do anything, we seek the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. And then we uh, understand that the shaitan has no power over us. The shaitan cannot compel us, cannot force us to, to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He cannot force us to commit sin. He only tempts and he only whispers in our ear. He cannot force us to do anything. So if we do, then we are following in his, in his footsteps. We should not do that. And then Allah says, he has no power over you as long as you have Iman. And as long as you have tawakkul on Allah, you have reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what must you do? Say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. But if you don't do that, if you have, if you follow the shaitan, if you, if you believe him, uh, if you obey him and disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then, the, then you are on your own. Because he then will have power over you and he has power over those who join partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To come to the close of our uh, session, or almost to the close, so why learn about the MBA? There are four major reasons why we need to learn about the MBA. Number one, as I mentioned before, is to reflect. Reflect on their life, reflect on their stories, and then reflect on our own lives. For example, if I'm, uh, if I'm, if I, if we learn about the life of Musa alayhi salam. Uh, Musa alayhi salam's life is a classic example of how to stand up against authority. How to stand for the truth, how to stand for justice, how to stand for stand, uh, stand up for people who are being oppressed against somebody who has superior authority, power, uh, who is cruel, who is, uh, who is very powerful, but not to fear that person but to stand before that person with complete and, and, and total confidence in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this is, a, this is one of the, the many lessons, inshallah, we'll come to that, but one of the major lessons from the life of Musa alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam was, a, was an activist, Musa alayhi salam was a, was, a, was a fighter. So we learn this beautiful lesson from the life of Musa alayhi salam of how to stand up against injustice. So the reflection. So we think about this and we say, we reflect and we say, okay, this is the lesson I have learned from the life of Musa alayhi salam. Now, next part of, reflect, of that reflection, how do I apply it in my life? If I am reading about Musa alayhi salam and I have learned the lesson of how Musa alayhi salam stood up against injustice and then I sit silently while injustice is happening in my life before me, then I have not learned anything. Then this le lesson which I learned, will become a proof against me, will become a hujjat against me on the Day of Judgment when I stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if I have learned something, then this must show in my life. If it is not showing in my life, then what have I learned? So that is the reflection. Number two, we learn because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us to learn and He said, follow them because they were rightly guided. And this is the purpose of the Anbiya alayhi wasalam. They came to be obeyed, they came to be followed. We follow the last and final of them, the Amir of them, the Imam of them, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We believe in all of them. We believe that all of them were Anbiya alayhi wa sallam. They were all prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we follow the last and final one of them. And then third reason is to know them so that you can love them. Because this is the beauty of the lives of the Anbiya alayhi wa sallam. In the lives of other people, 
the closer you go to a person, the more you know about a person, the more the person's faults come to the fore, they come to your attention. Uh, they say familiarity breeds contempt. But in the case of Abdi Anbiya Ali Musalam, familiarity breeds respect and familiarity breeds love and hope for them. And the last one is to create a good positive role models for ourselves because this is essential to prevent the influence of bad role models. We've got plenty of bad role models today uh, in our lives, in this world, and therefore we need a counter to that, we need a detox to that, we need an antidote to that poison of bad role models, and that antidote is the lives of the Anbiya Alayhi Finally, uh, I want to repeat this, uh, which I said earlier, once we hear a story or a part of a story, I would recommend that you reflect on the lessons from that and see how we can apply them in our own lives. I will try to draw out the lessons as I understand them and I would like you to reflect and I would like you to share your own understandings also. In the live session, this is a live session, you're going to, uh, you, you can type your uh, questions and comments and inshallah I am right here and I will uh, respond to them inshallah. Uh, finally, we leave with the action plan. If you see the slide, what am I going to start doing? What am I going to stop doing? What will I continue to do? After listening to the life of the Ambi Ali Musalam, what is it from their life which I was not doing, which I will start doing? What is it from their lives which I, which I learned that what I am doing in my life that does not tally with what the Nabi did, therefore I will stop doing that. And what is it that I am doing in my life today which is good, Alhamdulillah, so I will do that more consciously. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalaluhu to be pleased with you and never to be displeased. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, enable all of us to learn from this uh, so that we uh, we can we can please him uh, jalla jalaluhu. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ensure that uh, these lessons that we are studying here uh, become a means of guidance for us and become a means of shafaat before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that we don't ignore these lessons and these lessons do not become a argument against us. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased with you for coming here, for attending the session. I request you to make dua. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I make dua to, for all of you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should protect you from all evil in this world and in the next world and to keep you free from all want and to provide you from his own treasures in his own way in keeping with his majesty and grace. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyil kareem wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in bi rahmatika ya rahmatul rahimin. Wa salam alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.